Hello and welcome to Plant CEO. Today, uh, my guest is Lisa Gawthorn, MD and owner of Bruvara Foods. And also she's in her spare time uh, and when she's not running her food company is also a Team GB athlete. Welcome, uh, Lisa. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're welcome. So um, you come from a, a marketing background. Um, it'll be great to hear your story in, in terms of your career, but also to become an athlete. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I did um, a degree in um, business studies and marketing at John Moores in Liverpool. And uh, during that degree, I uh, went uh, to work for Chewix, the, the kids' confectionery brand, uh, as an undergraduate placement. Did a lot of kind of brand management and assistant brand management um, jobs there and then basically moved on from there when I graduated, then got a job with Vimto um, as a brand manager and did a lot more of that kind of things in terms of planning TV campaigns um, and doing all the kind of PR for them. And then same really kind of just started to work my way up the ladder over the years and ended up then as a group product manager at Burton's Biscuits looking after the likes of um, Jammy Dodgers and... <laughs> And chocolate fingers and things like that um, and then it was at the point really when I decided to uh, really kind of work for a company that matched my ethics so I then went to work for um, the then distributor at the time called Cedar Health who distributed Panda Licorice, a big big brand of, uh, of the business that we have today and um, so it was very much about following my morals there and, and mixing that with my marketing background in FMCJ. And a lot of the background was um, when you were looking at channels, marketing channels, was around TV and press at the time, uh, or was it also coming into the beginning of the digital area? Uh, it was very much, uh, even being honest, very much TV focused. TV and prints were king. Um, they were the real kind of aspects of where all budget was getting spent. Digital was just starting to creep in. But it was funny because it was in the days when people didn't think digital would be big and yeah. people just assumed it'll only be 10% of the revenue. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously things have changed a lot now and, and the marketing landscape obviously indeed has changed a lot to go with that. Yeah, totally. Um, so um, the licorice brands that you started working on, first of all, uh, they're uh, a company based in Finland, right? Um, yeah, uh, that's correct. So how, how, how did you, back in those days, how did you market that, uh, that brand to... To, to build awareness of it? So um, it was basically, well, we act as the, the UK exclusive distributor. So uh, with all sense and purposes, no one really understands or, or has the prior knowledge unless they've researched the brand to understand that it comes from Finland. They just see it on the shelves in Sainsbury's or Holland and Barrett and assume it's an English brand. So what we set about to do was that, that very aim, make sure that it's positioned in the UK so people believe that it's a brand close to home. So it was just in the early stages, there was a lot of trade PR that we did um, to kind of really boost the relationship and boost the awareness with all of the main retailers and wholesalers. Um, and then following that through, when we got the adequate distribution and availability on shelf, it was then more about um, integrating that more into a consumer PR campaign. Uh, working with their PR agency to, to really identify key consumer targets, particularly in, in printed press in the early days. Um, in the latter days, that's really moved over into more more digital. Um, and we really do work very closely with our retailers to ensure that we try and do promotional uh, calendar and promotional uh, business plans that really push the product into the, the domain of where the, the customer is actually shopping at the fixture store. Um, so a lot of trade marketing is involved in, in that process. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you made the switch in terms of your ethics, just thinking back uh, when you were six years old uh, is when oh. you actually went vegan, correct? Um, can, you, can you think of the story of what made you change your, your ethics then and your diet? Yeah, absolutely. It was vegetarian. So I turned ve vegetarian when I was six and I turned vegan in 2003, uh, so 17 years ago. Um, basically, very simple process. And I, re I remember this, and it's a, it's a question I do get asked a lot, but I remember the, the moment quite vividly. Um, I went to the front door because my local newspaper had been uh, put through the door, and I always used to, to take it through to my mum and dad. And there was um, a leaflet that dropped out of the paper, and it was a bright neon leaflet um, put together by PETA, so people for the ethical treatment of animals. 
And um, what attracted me to it is that there were cartoons of cows on there. Um, so again, I, it, it kind of spoke to me as a child. It was in the right language, the right tone. And I, I made that connection instantly because it was talking about factory farming and, and meat production, dairy production. And I basically just had that very awkward conversation with my parents and said, you know, is this true? Is what we're eating actually an animal? Um, and my parents, bless them, they were very honest with me and said, well, yes, it is. Um, to that point, I said, I don't ever want to, to have this ever again. Um, and I hadn't had a lot of meat in my life anyway. Very, very limited. We were always flexitarian back in those days. Mm. So there was a battle of wills for a few weeks um, when my parents still thought, oh, she'll eat it. And then kind of thinking, oh, she's not eating it. What are we going to do? And then from there on in, I spent a good 10 years uh, surviving on what was uh, the only brand that I could buy back then called Bird's Eye Vegetable Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was my kind of daily diet really because there was nothing all the choice that we have now is so wonderful and so beautiful we don't we didn't have any of that back then so it, it was very much a challenge for mum to shop that category and to try and ensure that I remained healthy and um, kind of you know active and stuff so yeah that was that was back in the day when I was six and I've never had meat since amazing um, and so vegan since 2003 you mentioned correct yeah um, so yeah, g going back in terms of like, at which point did you look at uh, becoming an athlete? Uh, and what age were you? Was it you saw your talents when you were at school? Or how early on was that? Um, no, to be honest, I didn't see them at school. Um, because school was very much I went to a grammar school and all sports were very focused on netball, hockey, rounders, um, and there's kind of, and even tennis. And there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a great deal of focus put on athletics. So I really only discovered um running and a lot of running really at university. Um, and I used to run on my dinner breaks or at the end of the day, um, mainly as a stress relief uh, when I found that things like preparation for exams was getting too high intense or, or stressful and then I just started to enter a couple of races um, and I think my first 10k I did in about 51 minutes um, so um, you know I've got that right down to, to 38.46 now so I've come a long way since then so for about a year I, I was doing the odd race here and there raising a bit of money for charity and then it was um, a race called um, Run the Tunnel in the Mersey Tunnel um, in the UK that I did and I ended up finishing third in it um, in about 44 minutes and I was unaffiliated at the time um, and a friend of mine said you know you need to come down to, to the track you need to train with some uh, athletes you, you've really got your time down to a decent level on your own but we can do a lot more as a team so I joined um, a club called Liverpool Pembroke Sefton back in 2007 um, and I've been training with them ever since. Yeah oh wow okay and uh, your, your times are really fast now uh, also your 5k I think you mentioned before was 18. Uh, 18.59. Yeah, yeah, that's really quick. Um, <laughs> how how much do you think it's due to your diet, your plant based diet, that you've been able to get down to those numbers? Or I know, think there's a, I think there's a big part, a real bit, and I'm not just saying that because I'm vegan, but yeah. it's, it's the basic premise of a plant based diet, a vegan diet, um, is great for helping um, reduce recovery time, um, helping eliminate. Um, well, I used to sleep quite badly, and when I took dairy out of my diet, my sleep was the best it's ever been. Um, I think it played havoc with my digestive system and my skin. Um, so better sleep for an athlete is really important. You said that we put dairy out of your diet, it became yeah. better. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so um, I think as an athlete, um, we all need good sleep. So better and more restored sleep was a big advantage I saw. Um, the other one was a huge, huge change in energy levels. Um, because a lot of the vegan foods that we eat are very um, rich in phytonutrients and things like that, we're constantly putting an influx of vitamins and minerals into our system um, and plant-based um, you know, elements. In the, that's really providing quite a good sustainable long journey of energy throughout the day. So people always say to me, how do you do it? How do you stay so energetic? And why are you always so kind of frenetic? I don't drink coffee. I've been caffeine free for nearly 10 years now. Um, and I put it down to a vegan diet. I just think you get out what you put in. And I've always had really high energy levels since I went vegan. And that's massively noticeable, just changing from the vegetarian to vegan diet as well. Yeah. And uh, you must be very stringent in terms of your macros. Um, and, you know, portion sizes and stuff um 
do you have um, common questions that you get asked about your, you know, your, your diet, your, your, you know, what you eat and also any supplements that you might take that you can yeah. share? Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody's favourite uh, question is where do you get your protein from? Um, and that still remains the number one question to this day. Um, and it's said in a number of different ways, you know, which of the foods you eat or do you struggle for your protein? And that, it's all means the same thing. Um, that is always an interesting talking point for me because I use um, a digital platform. I use um, MyFitnessPal um, and I use MyFitnessPal to track my calories and also my macros on a day-to-day basis. Um, and it's funny because whenever I have this conversation with someone, I just tot up what they've been eating during the day, potentially as a meat eater. And then I compare it to myself and 10 times out of 10, my protein is always higher because I'm yeah. consciously eating the right things. Yeah. And because protein isn't this big world issue we think it is. It's in so many different things. And if you get in your fruit, your veg, your legumes, your pulses and your meat alternatives, it all stacks up. Um, so it's never been an issue for me, but it certainly is the number one question I get asked. And I think the other one as well is, do I take vitamin B12? Um, because that's a, that's a big favourite. Now, as far back as I can remember, um, I've always took a vitamin B complex because I think it's important for athletes, um, particularly in the provision of energy. Um, and it just so happens that there is B12 in there. Um, I've been tested over the years and I've never once been B12 deficient. And it's only got about 30% of, of what you should have. So it just goes to show that, you know, the diet plus a little bit of supplementation has definitely got me on the right track. Yeah, I guess most of the population is also um, are deficient in B12, regardless of, of diets at the moment. So we could all, all do a bit more um, of eating the right things to try and get that increase, especially on the plant based uh, diet. Yeah, and I'm also not being scared of supplements. And I think there's a an old stigma out there that people generally don't want to take a tablet. Um, but I think that those walls are coming down and certainly in the athletic environment, um, vitamins are very important for, for recovery and for performance. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, a big, big one would be the inflammation. But are, are you seeing other um, team GB athletes looking to go plant based or just being more inquisitive or, you know, talking about the game changers or, you know, what the health and, you know, all, all these sort of documentaries that are out? I mean, do you, do you think there is a, a turn from from your fellow athletes? Um, 100 percent. It's funny you mention the game changers because. The, the, the day that that aired on Netflix, my phone almost broke. <laughs> I, I was so uh, bowled over by the amount of people that got in touch and said, that's it, I'm done. And I think the beauty about the game changes is, I'll be honest, I'm vegan for the animals because I'm the biggest animal lover, um, you know, that you'll meet and, and everything comes down to the moral aspect with me. But it goes to show that the attack that game changers took in that they were really portraying the great things it can do for your health. It really resonates with people. And when you talk to people on those base, the basis of either protecting the environment or protecting their health, um, it seems to have a little bit more of a stick, sadly, than, than talking to them just about animal welfare. So my phone went into overdrive and I was getting even vegan, even bodybuilders that, had ne- that used to take the, the, the mick out of vegans, even them getting in touch and saying, that's it, I'm doing it. Tell me where to get my stuff from, which is the best cheese, which is the best milk, which is the best meat substitute. Um, and that went on for weeks and to be honest to this day still goes on with a variety of people that I've met both professionally and personally so I think that the game changes definitely has shook the bag up so to speak um, and on the Team GB uh, circuit yes I've seen a real um, change there I'd say in the four years that I've been representing GB there's been a definite change um, lots more vegetarians lots more vegans um, one of my friends who uh, I literally went out to Spain with um, she, Laura Prescott, she actually finished third um, in Europe, so came home with a bronze medal. She's a previous gold medalist. She's fantastic, and she's uh, been vegan now, I think, just for over a year. Um, and their partner, Rob's gone vegan, and their children have gone vegan as well. So that's just one example. There were many other people coming up to me saying, I follow you on Twitter or I follow you on Instagram. And, um, you know, I've really changed my diet because of you. So I love hearing those things because if you've helped one person, just one person make that change, then you know that it's reducing, hopefully, in the long term, the amount of animals that are being slaughtered. Yeah, totally. And I guess uh, even more so today, people are looking at their health whilst they're on lockdown and um, um, looking at the immunity and, and then looking at the bigger picture, right, in terms of the, the meat and dairy industry right now. 
Yeah. Uh, for those people that are on lockdown, is there any advice that you would give them in terms of staying fit and what they can do at home? Um, any general advice that you would say? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first thing is if you've got a pair of running trainers and you haven't got an injury, um, I'd say start just running around the block. If you're new to running, just take a just take a couple of minutes each day and build it up. Don't go out there the first day and think, right, that's it, I'm going to run 10 miles because you're bound to pick up an injury. So small baby steps if you're new to running. Um, and the same really applies to cycling. If you've got um, a cycle in the garage, whether it's a hybrid, whether it's a mountain bike or a race bike, just take it out and start doing some distances and start comparing your times against the day before or the week before, etc. And start setting yourself some goals that are relatively achievable. I think a lot of people fall down because they try and do too much, too fast, too soon. Um, so it's about keeping it achievable. And the other thing is, if you really don't fancy going out for a run or going for a cycle and you want to do something actually in your home or potentially in your garage or your garden, I always say dial yourself back to military fitness. So we can all go and we can all do burpees, we can all do press-ups and sit-ups, um, you know, bunny hops, squats, etc. We can do things just using our body weight and we don't necessarily need to have a plethora of weights around us. You can do body weight fitness um, and you can do Pilates and yoga or just using the weight of your body, which also is a fantastic thing. Um, I often use something called Fit Deck, which is a fantastic thing. So it's a deck of cards. And you just shuffle yourself out and you work out. It randomizes your workout all the time. So sometimes it'll say, like, do 10 press-ups or it might say do five sit-ups. And you just keep on shuffling it all the time. So you're just randomizing things. And, yeah, keep yeah. It and again, all of those are just body weight things that I'll do. Yeah, that's quite a good idea. It might be good to play that with the kids. Yeah, <laughs> and you can do it if you've just got a normal pack of cards. So you can say to yourself, like, diamonds is sit-ups, spades is press-ups. And um, you know, hearts is squats, etc. And then whatever the number is, that's how many to do. And it's oh, quite right. okay. okay, that's yeah. great. Idea. Um, so you're also the author of your own um, health and fitness book um, called Gone in 60 Minutes. Yeah. Did you get the inspiration from the title from Gone in 60 Seconds? You know, the film with Nicolas Cage. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I won't lie, it's a bit of a play on that. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> I was thinking. Um, so, yeah, I was looking for a title. Sorry. Yeah, tell me more about the book. It's uh, be good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, so I was looking for a title. I wanted to create a book um, because a lot of people come up to me in the gym, at the track, um, on social media, and I was noticing I was getting asked the same questions over and over and over again. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to actually create a book um, with a website and with a Twitter feed. And it just gives people food for thought. Um, and I did that oh God, back in, I think it was 2010. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a while since that book's come to, to fruition since I wrote it. But the premise of the book and the reason why it's called Gone in 60 Minutes is because I wanted to write something that people can read within one hour. Because people are very, very time poor. Everyone's rushing around. People haven't got time to read fitness bibles that are like this. So I took all the knowledge that, that I've been getting from magazines, from journals, from working with different personal trainers, from working with teams, sports teams, and I put it all into a book on what works. I've got case studies in there about what, what it did to my body fat over a certain um, period of time, what it did to my performance, supplements that I found worked for me, dietary kind of pointers to help people. And there's even a 16-week perpetual training calendar in there if people are struggling to know what to do and they can follow that for, for different aspects. Um, but it really is quite a controversial book because it challenges quite a lot of the old school ways of thinking and um, talks about the importance of lifting weights because there still is to this day, sadly, um, a belief in the um, in the public that people will get bulky if they lift weights. And it just isn't the case at all, especially if you're a uh, female and you, you're on a calorie controlled diet and females are the ones that come to me the most and say I really don't want to lift weights in case they get bulky and you know it's a, it's a, it's a learning process for them so I wanted to put all that in a book somewhere and a resource where I can just direct them to it um, and further help them through through the social media as well. Yeah I mean lifting weights is also really important as you get older with it also helps does it help with bone density? Um, yes, yeah, so up to the age of 30, it builds your bone bank, yeah. um, so which is fantastic. And even then, it's about keeping your strength going. And the biggest advantage um, that people should take away from weights is that after you've stopped um, lifting the weights, you'll burn, you'll burn calories and fat for 24 hours afterwards. And a lot of people don't understand that. They just think, oh, well, it won't be as good as a raw, but it really revs the, the metabolic system up. 
I always say people think of your, your metabolism like a fire and you're throwing logs on it all the time. That's what weightlifting is doing. And if you do that along with sort of snacking every two hours, healthy snacking and keeping the metabolism moving, you can get some really good results on your physique and also on your sporting performance as well. Yeah. So uh, when you're like if you're, if you're when you're eating, for example, when you're training, if you are uh, snacking every few hours, I guess you're having the, the nuts uh, in between your main meals. Uh, and you might be able to have six, eight meals a day, do you think, if you're including the snacks? Um, yeah, that's it. So that's what I do is I do three slightly larger meals and then I'll do three snacks. Um, and the snacks can range from anything from a high protein yogurt to banana and peanut butter to a handful of nuts. All of those kind of things are probably, might even be a protein bar or an organic protein shake. Um, my main meals I tend to keep as clean as possible during the week. Um, I'd say for five to six days a week, I try and keep them clean. So I have a homemade muesli I make in the morning for breakfast. Lunch times tend to be rice and tofu or beans and tofu. Um, and dinner will be things like either vegan sausages, broccoli, green beans, anything like that. And then I'll relax it a little bit at the weekends. Um, you know, I'm not too fussed if I have some cake or some biscuits or some crisps, etc. Um, and I just find that that works quite well for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, if I've had a stressful day at work, I will open a pack of crisps. I'm not that controlled. Um, but the way that I work that is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, a method called IIFYM, if it fits your macros. No, I haven't so heard. It basically that? It allows you to eat a little bit. I'm not talking about junk food, but slightly outside. You can put in a biscuit or you can put in um, some crisps, etc. So long as it doesn't offset your macros. So at the moment for me, I'm working to a macro of 50% um, carbs, 50% pro 25% protein and 25% fats, because that's working for me right now. Mm. It's keeping injuries at bay. It's making me feel good. I've got energy and it's good for performance. So I just make sure that if I do eat something that slightly puts the fat levels up, then I will just eat something to counterbalance that by having something either carb or, or, or um, protein um, kind of rich to kind of balance it out. And a lot of people do live that way now, but you can't be putting in like bake well tarts during the day and things like that. You've got to kind of take it with a pinch of salt and just maintain that level of looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking, is this working for me? And also, more importantly than looking in the mirror, is looking at your performance and thinking, is this making me go slower or faster? Because that's what we're all here for in athletics. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Um, so moving to um, Bravura uh, Foods, um, yep. can you tell me more about uh, the brands that you distribute and uh, also the ones that you own because you own a number of uh, brands as well. Um, yeah, correct. And, uh, yeah, which ones that you're really excited about now as well? Okay, um, so our distributor brands are Panda Licorice, um, Freedom Mallows, which is the vegan uh, mallow range, um, and we also have um, another brand called Little Miracles, um, which is a range of um, very kind of healthy organic uh, fruit juice drinks. Then our own brands that we have are Peanut Hossie, which has actually evolved now from being a drink into a powdered, defatted peanut uh, powder. Um, we also have um, Free From Fellows, which is a range of sugar-free, gluten-free, and gelatin-free gummies and hard-boiled sweets. And um, our, new, our newest launch, which we're most excited about, is our CBD uh, range of drinks called The Leaf Life. And we're just in the, the very early stages of, of getting that brand um, launched in the UK. Um, and that's taken up a lot of our time, along with we've got two more launches happening this year. One in vegan sports nutrition, which is going to be really exciting, um, across things like protein powders, BCAAs, um, pre-workouts, post-workouts, cookies, bars, etc. So um, that's a new range. Of, that's of... a whole new range, yeah, and that's a distributor brand that we're uh, doing a joint venture with them on, which is a fantastic range, and that's going to be going out in September. Um, and then one of the brands, uh, which is called Doodles, and that is um, a lightly sparkling range of uh, soft drinks that's going to be targeted primarily at kids in a colour me can, which allows them to colour the can, wipe it and recolour it. And that is going to be going out in September as well. Um, so we've got quite a nice mix of distributed brands and own brands. Yeah. Um, but irrespective of which the brand is, they all follow the same route to market in that we deal with all the supermarkets, we deal with all the high street retailers and all the main wholesalers in the UK and they, they all funnel down those sectors yeah um are you are you finding any sort of retailers more 
in advanced in in terms of their trend and their thinking in terms of what ones they're they're open to start especially in 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 relation to plant-based uh, uh, meals and you know i know they can track things like you know who's searching for what on their sites if it's online and um do you have any thoughts around that or can you speak i think they could do a lot better i think uh, we're uh, give them credit where credit's due particularly a shout out to sainsbury's things what sainsbury's have done both in their ambient and their chill section uh, for vegans has been fantastic and waitrose are, are very very similar and in fact tesco is really really up in its game now as well um i think that where they could do better probably is is with more analytics and more targeted approaches to work with us and to help us kind of target those consumers a little bit more but it's very early stages remember some of these multiples have only built these ranges out in the last 12 to 18 months so they're just learning themselves and right now i think what their priority remains is to make sure that they've got the basics covered um, and they've got let's say the staple parts covered so the vegan burger the vegan sausage before they get too exotic and bring in the vegan ice creams or, or, or all those kind of things and I've, I've definitely seen in the last 12 months um a major change in that and i think they are becoming more um let's say more intelligent with it but i think with regards to digital platforms and omnichannel kind of opportunities there's a, there's a long way to go with that yeah so um my family are a big family uh, favorites of your freedom mellows um and um thinking about those sort of digital channels um how you know there's stuff that you can do with the retailers um which is where you can add extra marketing and, and budgets with them um what would you do outside of those on, on digital channels is that something that you're investing in as well yeah i mean again freedom Mallow is, is a distributor brand so the actual uh, owners of that brand do a lot of the marketing themselves and we work in with them to do a bit of trade marketing but right. the main aspect that we're using there is targeted social media um so and also selected print media as well in the likes of vegan life and um vegan food and living etc all those kind of titles and um, they're very good as well and we work with them on this in terms of uh, having presence at shows and whilst that's all on stop at the moment due to covid and um, consumer shows have been very important because i think the thing is with a lot of these um products is people need to try them to understand because i think there's a lot of people that think oh it won't taste as good as normal mallow when actually everyone that tastes it says it's better than the normal mallow um, yeah. so trialing is very important so sampling at the point of purchase is something we've done in the past lots of shows um and with yeah, regards to like sampling is quite hard at the moment i guess you have to pause that until until we come out of COVID. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think that you're going to see for the next, I would say, three to six months, a lot of people putting more money into digital because we can't do the shows, the sampling, the goodie bags. Um, so geo, um, geo-targeted geo campaigns yeah. Yeah. Uh, can be very important and something we're looking at company-wide for all of our brands um, because I think that that is really important to, to really kind of hone in the resources. Totally. Um, so what sort of products are you looking out for next, either um, to help distribute in, in this market or ones that you're looking to develop yourself? Is that something that you can talk about? What's, what's yeah, the, I mean, we are. That later this year with, with the, um, you know, the vegan uh, protein ranges and yeah. Yeah, so that's important. The, the protein range and the Doodles brand is going to be very important for us. Um, but just as important, really, is the expansion of our current range. Um, so our Free From Fellows brand, which primarily was a sugar-free brand, we're now going to uh, develop that into having just some vegan sugar range as well. Um, Freedom Mallows is going to evolve more into some chocolate coverings and potentially other coverings as well. Um, nice kind of impulse smaller bags, impulse smaller bars, because impulse is very much, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's experiencing high rates of sale at the moment. Um, in a lot of the high street retailers and um, but yeah i'd say on on the on the subject of that a lot of things are going to be really down to distribution increasing on the store in the stores that we've already got um, and also expanding our range through flavor expansion re, re, reformatting the packaging and um, something that we're working on at the moment which is amazing we are redesigning the entire free from fellows range 
which has been a huge project. We have seven SKUs um, in that range, and then we have a further four um, that are in a different way, and then we've got to redesign everything. So that's been fantastic. And the um, the old versus the new packaging is unbelievable, and we think we're going to you know see some good success from that. So redesigns, reformulations, repackaging, and just making sure that we can get as much distribution for our current range as we can, because what we are not is a business that just keeps on saying, we'll take another brand, we'll take another brand. We're very selective over the brands that are in our portfolio they have to be very unique very very quirky and they have to bring something new to the category what we don't do is launch me too products it's not what reviewer is about everything that we have in our in our portfolio is very quirky um, and very unique and you have to have that story you know and, and if you've got that story on the back set of passionate founders myself and carl that own the business um, who are both vegan then it really really helps Absolutely. Um, and selling that to the, to the trade. Yeah, totally. Um, and um, so what's um, what sort of advice th- or, you know, thinking if you had to do something over again, w- would you give to new entrepreneurs who are looking to come into this space? Um, I would, first of all, I would say as a little checklist, make sure that they've got the passion for it because passion will always be the platform that, that literally lets you hover into the areas of success. So I'd say make sure your passion is in the right area. Don't get taken along with something that you're not passionate in because it'll make every day hard. Um, so if you've got that passion and that belief and that motivation, that kind of, it's so infectious. If you stand in front of a Sainsbury's fire and they can feel the passion and see the energy, <clears throat> it makes it so much easier to do the selling. So I'd yeah. say make sure you've got your passion. And also don't be afraid to tell a founder's story because a founder's story now more than ever is so important product heritage and product provenance is more important now than it ever has been and people are generally interested well why did you develop this product what what pain points are you solving what happened in your life to make you think do you know what yeah that's what we need to develop and don't be frightened of taking that forward because all of those challenger brands that are doing well in the market right now have all got really strong backdrops to, oh i created something in the kitchen and then my mates liked it and then and then everyone liked it and then all the school friends liked it and then before you know it you you found the people that like it and you've got a credible story to take to a business so i'd say really harness that um, and take passion along with the founder story uh, into into the future yep great and um so what's next with you in terms of uh, the food business and um team gb i know you're working on the um the world championships in holland uh, hopefully it still goes ahead this year but it'd be great to see what your thoughts are around around those two areas yeah, definitely. So business-wise, we've got a lot on our plate, a lot of launches um, and a lot of exciting things, which obviously we, you, people will see over the coming months as we start to strip that out into the press and hopefully the world goes back to some normality. Um, pro- pro- professional-wise, on the sports level um, or outside of uh, business, um, yes, I've got the World Championships for Duath on in September, hoping that goes ahead in, in Almeida, in Holland. Um, at the moment, it is going ahead, but... We're all, we're all preparing just in case it does get um, cancelled um, and I'm training for that so I'm splitting my days at the moment one day on cycling, one day on running and um, okay. making sure that I'm boxing off both speed um, but also endurance um, because the discipline that I do is at Olympic sprint distance so that's a 5k run at the beginning um, and then it's 20k on the bike and then 2.5k run at the end so it's quite fast, it's quite okay. punchy, um, you've got to get your yeah. fast twitch muscles working so you can't just be plodding in and, and hope to get through on that there's nowhere to hide and um, so it really is about speed sessions and getting those speed sessions on point over the coming months so on the on the 20k ride what what is your ta- what is your time you're aiming for for that um well, it differs because if it's a flat course, it's very different to a hilly course. Yeah, you know, last year in, Pont- yeah. in Pontevedra, every course is different. In Pontevedra, we had um, 60% of our course was completely uphill, um, which was really tough. But then obviously we had the descent, which was fantastic. Uh, the last course that I did in um, uh, Ponte Umbria was completely pan flat. Um, so it was you know, particularly fast. So your flat courses, you might be somewhere between sort of 36 to 38 minutes. Your hilly courses, you might be somewhere between 38 to 42 minutes. Um, I just try and stick and hover near to the magic 20 mile an hour as much as I can. That's like okay. a magic number. That I try that's and keep a, it. That's a fast pace if you're doing yeah. 20. 
Yeah. 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 Um, That's it, right. it, with running, the big thing is, is you, you've got to get these little milestones in your head. And I think with running, if you can do all your efforts near to six minute mile pace, this is for what I'm doing at the moment. And if I can keep my, my bike near to 20, 21 minute mile, um, mile an hour, then near, if you can keep that and sustain that, you know, you're kind of on track. They're my little sort of go to milestones. Yeah, yeah awesome. So yeah, it's been a been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on uh, on the show, and um, wish you the best of luck in, in September. Hopefully, it all goes ahead, and and for uh, the new lines of business as well. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, if you uh, want to hear more, um, please do comment and uh, and subscribe. But uh, that's all for this time. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you.